Okay, we are live on Facebook as well. Hi, welcome everybody. Should we start? Okay. Sure, I think we can start. Great. Well, my name is Sarah Bunin Benor, and I am the director of the Jewish Language Project at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. And I want to thank Sapir and Jemena for inviting me to do this lecture today. Uh, here's how it's going to work. I'm going to do a pre-recorded lecture that, that I recorded as part of a concert on March 15th. And then I'm going to show you clips from the concert as they could be used at a Passover Seder. So we're going to start with some images of Passover tables from around the world. Sarah, if I may add that if anyone has a question during the presentation, you can write them down in the chat and Sarah's going to address them um, at the end. Yes, thank you. And also, um, please make sure to keep yourselves muted. And uh, if you do have questions, I'll look forward to answering those later. Welcome to Passover Around the World, a multimedia concert. We're so glad you've joined us for this virtual event. We have a wonderful evening planned for you today, some delicious food that you won't get to taste, some wonderful music. The musicians did original compositions specifically for this event, and an introduction to Jewish languages. I'm Dr. Sarah Bunin Benor, a professor at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. I'm the director of the newly founded Jewish Language Project, an initiative at HUCJIR. And I'm thrilled to be presenting our very first event. First, we would like to show you what Seder tables look like in various parts of the world. You might think of a Seder table as including a Seder plate, but it's not always a plate. In some cultures, it is a tray, like in the Bukharian tradition, or a basket tray in the Libyan tradition, or a Yemenite Seder table where the entire table is covered with the ceremonial foods. And the ceremonial foods are different in each culture. Instead of salt water, some groups use lemon juice. And instead of the shank bone, uh, Yemenite Jews, for example, use a meat stew to represent the korban, the sacrifice. Sometimes maror is a radish or parsnip, and karpas can be parsley, but it can also be shredded beet salad. And in the Libyan Seder basket tray, we see some distinctive items. We see Belgian endive for maror, and the charoset is called lachlik, and it's made into little balls. And the karpas is celery. And in the Bukharian Seder tray, we see that the chazeret is romaine lettuce and the maror is a radish. And also they have lemon juice instead of salt water to represent the bitterness. Now these Seder tables, trays, and plates come from 
this wonderful book called Too Good to Pass Over by Jennifer Felicia Abadi, which has not only wonderful recipes, but also information about how Passover has been celebrated in various Jewish communities around the world. And we wanted to bring you a taste of that with the food samples that we were going to serve you. And I'm so sorry that I have to tell you about this and that you can't actually taste it in person. But here is the menu that we were planning to serve you at this event. A food for several different locations with a language associated with it. So from Romania, where Yiddish was spoken. Charoises with apple, walnut, and wine. And from Morocco, where Haketia, a Judeo-Spanish language, Judeo-Arabic, and Judeo-Berber are spoken. Lachlik, a similar charoset, but made with date, walnut, ginger, etc. And from Iran, where Judeo-Persian and Judeo-Median are spoken. Kuku Sabzi, a baked herb omelet. From Azerbaijan, where Judeo Tat, also known as Juhuri, was spoken. Badamjan Choyagusht, eggplant onion frittata. From Georgia, where Judeo Georgian was spoken, Espanaki Pali, ground walnut spread with spinach, garlic, coriander, and onion. And from Iraq, for dessert, haji badam, flourless almond cookies with rose water and cardamom. And we thank got kosher for their wonderful catering, and I hope you all get to try it sometime in the future. Let me tell you a little bit about Jewish languages by starting out with the Passover Haggadah, or Haggadah. The Haggadah is a document that helps Jews to do the ceremony on the eve of Passover. And in the traditional Haggadah, there are three languages. Most of it's written in Hebrew. Some aspects are written in Aramaic, Judeo-Aramaic, also an ancient language. And the word afikomen, the matzah that is eaten at the end of the Seder, is a word from Greek. But the Passover Haggadah has been translated into dozens of languages around the world. Here are just a few examples of the languages that the Haggadah has been translated into. And languages at the Passover Seder are just as diverse. Wherever Jews have lived, they have conducted the Passover Seder in a combination of Hebrew, Aramaic, maybe that one Greek word, Judeo-Greek, and their local language. What are those local languages? Well, that goes back to antiquity. If you see the purple dot in the middle of your screen, that is the land of Israel, where the Jewish people originated. And when they were expelled, and for various other reasons, they moved to parts of North Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and parts of Asia. And when they moved, they eventually picked up a version of the local language and Judaified it. So there are Jewish versions of all of these languages that you see on your screen right now. Judeo-Italian, Judeo-Greek, Judeo-Persian, Judeo-Tajik, Judeo-Malayalam in Southern India. And the two most famous Jewish languages, Yiddish and Ladino, are actually exceptions to this history of diaspora linguistic distinctiveness. Because when the Jews moved from Germanic lands to Slavic lands, they maintained their Germanic language, and that's what we know as Yiddish. And when Jews moved from Spain to the Ottoman Empire and to other places, they maintained their Judeo-Spanish language, and that is what we know as Ladino. But in the other locations where Jews lived, they spoke a Judaized version of the local language, perhaps with Hebrew words often written in Hebrew letters and other distinctive features. And they might be quite similar to the language of their non-Jewish neighbors, or they might be as distinct as to be mutually unintelligible. But all of this changed in the 18th to 20th centuries the languages that had been in these places for hundreds of years were affected by various historical developments, emancipation, modernization, urbanization, and then in the 20th century, the Holocaust and Stalinism. 
and migrations based on these events to the Americas, to Israel, to Western Europe, led to changes in the languages. Most of the long-standing languages shifted so that people who spoke Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, Jewish Neo-Aramaic, Jewish Malayalam, Judeo-Median, Judeo-Tat, and Judeo-Tajik shifted to English in America and Hebrew in Israel and Spanish in Mexico, for example. And these languages have become mostly endangered, with some exceptions, which we'll talk about in a minute. But new languages have developed in these places. Jewish versions of English, of Latin American Spanish, Jewish Portuguese, Jewish Swedish, Jewish French, Jewish German, Jewish Russian, Jewish Hungarian. And these languages are thriving and developing. Now you might think, well, they're not languages, they're just dialects of their local language. And that's true, but it's also the case for many Jewish languages throughout history. Some were so different from the language of their non-Jewish neighbors that you might think of them as separate languages, but many were mutually intelligible. And that is the case with new Jewish languages today. So how are long-standing Jewish languages doing? Well, Yiddish is actually thriving because in Hasidic communities today, children are learning Yiddish. And that is the criterion for the vitality of a language, whether children are learning the language. Elsewhere, there is little intergenerational transmission of Yiddish, but there is strong post-vernacular engagement, meaning that people are involved with Yiddish, interested in Yiddish, even if they can't speak in full conversations. Aside from Yiddish, the other long-standing Jewish languages are endangered or almost endangered. And I'm gonna give you examples of this phenomenon by talking about Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Tat, and Judeo-Median. I'm going to give a brief history of each and talk about their current status and post-vernacular activity. Post-vernacular meaning if people aren't speaking the language anymore, but they are still engaging with the language in important ways. So first, Judeo-Arabic. The yellow parts that you see on the screen are where Judeo-Arabic is or was spoken. And it has been spoken since antiquity. You might know of some famous works that were originally written in Judeo-Arabic by Sadia Gaon, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, and Maimonides. And these were written in Hebrew letters. In the 19th and 20th centuries, there were many Judeo-Arabic periodicals from Bombay to Algeria to Egypt to Tunisia, etc. And there are many varieties of Judeo-Arabic, Libyan, Moroccan, Tunisian, Egyptian, Yemenite, Iraqi, Syrian, and Palestinian. And in general, these were the way that the Jews spoke in these places were more similar to the local non-Jewish variety than to the Jewish varieties in other places, but they also shared some common traits. Let me give you some examples of how diverse Judeo-Arabics can be. How do you say matzah in Judeo-Arabic? Well, in Yemenite Judeo-Arabic, it's mashumor. In Iraqi Judeo-Arabic, yardukai. In Egyptian Judeo-Arabic, fatir. And I apologize for my pronunciation, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how different these languages can be. How do you say charoset? In Yemenite Judeo-Arabic, it's duki. In Iraqi Judeo-Arabic, hilk, silan, or shira. And in Libyan Judeo-Arabic, lahlik. And they also look different and taste different in those different places. Now, what happened to Judeo-Arabic? Well, in the 1940s through 1960s, most Judeo-Arabic speakers moved to Israel, France, Mexico, Canada, and the US, and their descendants speak Hebrew, French, Spanish, and English. Most of the people who speak Judeo-Arabic today are elderly. There are still some communities in North Africa today, about 3,000 Jews in Morocco, but most of them speak French. About 1,100 Jews in Tunisia, most of them speak Muslim Tunisian Arabic, but the elderly there still speak some Judeo-Arabic. And there is post-vernacular activity, especially with music. 
For example, in Israel, Neta Al Kayam has a tribute to the Moroccan Jewish singer Zohra Al Fasia. And also in Israel, Awa, a Yemenite Judeo Arabic group, sings Yemenite, traditional Jewish Yemenite Judeo Arabic music with a contemporary beat. And tonight you'll have the pleasure of hearing Asher Shasho Levi, who sings Syrian Judeo Arabic music in a traditional style in the US. How is Judeo Arabic doing today? Well, as you might guess, it is not doing great. It is moribund because the only remaining active users are elderly. And I'm using the characterizations of vitality from Ethnologue, which provides statistics about languages in general and is the go-to place for how many people speak each language. But there is some post-vernacular use of Arabic. It is important for group identity to some extent. Now we move on to the second example language, Judeo-Tat, also known as Juhuri. It's spoken in this little area here, which is Azerbaijan and Dagestan. The Jews who speak this language are sometimes known as mountain Jews or Gorski or Kavkazim or Caucasian, but all of those are kind of misnomers. They are in cities like Derbent, Baku, and Kuba. The community has been present in this area since ancient times. And their language is a variant of Tat, which is on the Persian branch of the Iranian language family. It's related to Persian, and it's similar to Muslim Tat, but there are also many differences. There have been many publications in Judeo-Tat, written originally in Hebrew letters, then Latin starting in 1930, and then Cyrillic starting in 1938. And you can see some examples here of periodicals and books that were written from 1908 through 1991. And in fact, in 1938, Tat or Judeo-Tat was one of the 10 official languages in the USSR Republic of Dagestan, making it one of the few Jewish languages that has ever been an official language of a country. But from the 19th century to today, Judeo-Tat has slowly been replaced by Azerbaijani, Russian, and other languages in the Caucasus region, and by Hebrew in Israel. Some older people still use it, and parents still use it as a secret language when they don't want the kids to understand. There is some post-vernacular activity, some music in Judeo-Tat. We won't get to hear any of that tonight, but I recommend checking the Jewish language website for some examples. However, Judeo-Tat is still transmitted to children in one town, Kirmizi Kasaba, Azerbaijan. This is basically a Jewish town, and most of the people who live in this town are Jewish and therefore have been able to maintain their language. But even in Kirmizi Kasaba, all community members also speak other languages and educational instruction is in other languages. So the vitality of Judeo-Tat is threatened. The language is used for face-to-face -face communication within all generations, but it's losing users. And now our final example, Judeo-Median. Judeo-Median is a language family within Iran. It is an Iranian non-Persian language, so you can see on this language tree that it's not on the Persian branch of the Iranian language family, it's on the northwestern branch. And there are actually several Judeo-Median languages that are not mutually intelligible. Here I give you just a few examples of words in Judeo-Kashani, Judeo-Isfahani, Judeo-Hamadani, Judeo-Yazdi, and Judeo-Shirazi. And you can see how different these languages are. In the mid 20th century, most Jews in these areas moved to Tehran and other major cities and shifted to modern Persian with some Hebrew words. And from 1979 to the present, most Jews from Iran have emigrated, especially to New York, LA, and Israel. So the vitality of Judeo-Median is nearly extinct. The only remaining users of the language are elderly and have little opportunity to use the language. And there's also very little research on Judeo-Median, so we don't actually know how many speakers there are. So in conclusion, most long-standing Jewish language varieties are endangered, as their speakers are all or mostly elderly. And in the next 20 to 30 years, the last speakers will die. 
So now is the time to document the language varieties, cultures, and histories of Jewish communities around the world. And it's also time to share that knowledge. Why? For the last speakers of these languages, like Dr. Nasser Baravarian from New York, who is one of the last speakers of Judeo Isfahani and is being recorded by the Endangered Language Alliance. For Dr. Yona Sabar from Los Angeles, who is one of the last speakers of Jewish Neo-Aramaic. And you can see here a book that his son wrote about his language and culture. And in memory of Sarah Cohen from Cochin, India, who was one of the last speakers of Jewish Malayalam, and she just died a few months ago. But it's also important for the future, for research, and for students who want to learn these languages. For Jews around the world to know about these languages and to know about communities all around the world. And it's also useful for other groups, indigenous, immigrant, and religious groups, to learn about Jewish languages and hear about their history and how Jews today are engaging with them in post-vernacular ways. So how? How can we document these languages and share the information? Through the organization that I have just started, the Jewish Language Project of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, our mission is to promote research on, awareness about, and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. And this is our first event. And we have also created a Passover Haggadah supplement so that you can share these languages at your Passover Seder. It gives examples of how to say happy Passover and various phrases in many Jewish languages and songs and parts of the Seder that you can recite in these languages. You can also see materials on the Jewish language website from Passover and from other aspects where you can get clips video clips, audio clips, and texts. For example, how do you say Happy Passover in Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Tat, and Judeo-Median? Well, Judeo-Arabic in Morocco, you say Ikun Lik Eid Mbarak. In Judeo-Tat, Nisan Nushmu Shor Giro, which means may your Passover Nisan pass happily. And we don't actually know, I don't know, how to say Happy Passover in Judeo-Median because there hasn't been enough research on that. And that's why this kind of documentation is so important. So the next initiative of the HUC Jewish Language Project, in conjunction with the Endangered Language Alliance, is a documentation project of endangered Iranian Jewish languages in Los Angeles. Okay, so I am gonna switch now to the um, Passover Haggadah supplement that, or actually not Haggadah supplement, in addition to the Haggadah supplement that I created, I also created a PowerPoint Haggadah that can be used at Passover seders, whether they're done at home with just a small family or over Zoom. Uh, because now I know a lot of people are going to be doing their Passover seders via Zoom, and people were wondering how can I find a Haggadah to use. So I created one that uses the text of the traditional Haggadah, but then also incorporates a lot of the resources on the Jewish language website. And you can download that on the Jewish language website right now. So, or maybe wait till after this session is over. So I want to do a presentation from that PowerPoint right now. And it includes some video clips. So the first one is Asher Shasho Levy and Chloe Pomerati explaining the and demonstrating the tradition of Syrian Jews at the Yachatz part of the Passover Seder. Oh, wait, sorry, I need to do screen sharing again. One second. Okay, here we go.
So this is a, a, a custom that I actually look forward to at the Seder every year, where we take the middle masa of the three masot that are placed on the Seder table, and we break it into two pieces. We take um, the smaller piece is broken into the shape of the letter Vav, and the bigger piece is broken into a Dalit. It looks like a hay, actually. Um, there's Kabbalistic significance for that, for um, the names of God. So you have it looking like a hay, um, like the tefillin almost. Um, and so the smaller piece is placed back between the matzot, and then the larger piece is taken here like we're doing now, and this will become the afikoman. But before we go and we hide it and we continue on with the telling of the story, we have a little bit of a ritual that we do, a little bit of a part of the telling of the story where we really, we really act it out. So. The leader of the seder is going to do what I'm about to do right now. Take the masa in this napkin and places it in the right hand over the left shoulder of the participants of the seder and waves it while singing this verse. Mish'arotam serurot besimlotam al shikhmam ubenei Israel asu kidbar Moshe which means their remaining possessions tied up in their bags on their shoulders and the children of Israel did as Moses commanded. So we're acting out this moment in the Exodus where the children of Israel were leaving were with their possessions over their shoulders. And then we do a little skit in Arabic. Minjeh Mimisraim. The Wen Rai. Yerushalayim. And so that means, where are you coming from? Mimisraim, from Egypt. Where are you going? Yerushalayim. And we go around on the Seder table and we do this with the Masa to every participant until we've gone around to every single person. And then we reach the next step of the Seder, which is the Halachmania. Okay, I'm just gonna pause here and see if there are any questions in the chat. Let's see. Uh, yes, the video will be accessible after the fact, right? Is that right, um, Sapir? Yes, the video is live on Facebook uh, right now and people can join afterwards and watch the whole session uh, on Facebook. Okay. Uh, our page is Jemena, Jews Indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa. Great. Okay, so I guess I'll go back to the PowerPoint now with the next clip. So, oh, do you have a question? Can that link be emailed to us, those of us who registered? The link to the Facebook page? Yes. Sure, I will, I will email that uh, after the session, no problem. Okay, great. So we're gonna go back to the PowerPoint now. Uh, Sharon okay. asked me to repeat the name of the Facebook page. So it's Jemena, Jews Indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa. Great. And I will also send that after uh, the session to all the participants. Okay. So another interesting tradition is in the Yemenite Jewish community, Women didn't have the Hebrew education to understand the Haggadah, so they recited a summary of it in Judeo-Arabic. And this is actually something that's kind of missing from the Haggadah in general. There's not like a one paragraph summary of the whole story. And so here's what they say in Judeo-Arabic, but I'll read the English translation. What makes this night different from all nights? Our elders and forefathers left Egypt, the house of slavery. What did they do there? They mixed the straw with bricks and the bricks with straw. For whom? For Pharaoh, the absolute evil man, whose head is like a monster, whose mouth is like a furnace. And God brought upon the Egyptians blood, frogs, locusts, lice, beasts, cattle disease, boils, hail, darkness, and the slaying of the firstborn. Even a wrinkled old woman who had an idol made of dough, the dog came in and ate it, and she cried that night. That part was from a midrash. And there was a great outcry in Egypt to fulfill the verse that says, there was no house without someone dead. And God saved them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and great judgments, signs, and wonders. Through our leader, Moses, may he rest in peace. And that is the answer. There you go. That's the whole Seder. You don't need to do the rest. Okay, now, here is another tradition. This is a Moroccan Jewish tradition of waving the Seder plate over the heads of the participants. And I'm going to show you a very brief video clip of this from a communal Seder in Brazil. 
And they do this while reciting the Bibhilu Piyut, which has to do with leaving Egypt. <laughs> example of this Moroccan tradition. And okay, next I want to give you some examples of the four questions. The four questions have been recited in many, many Jewish languages, and there's even a book, 300 Ways to Say the Four Questions. And here are some examples in Tunisian, Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Greek, and Judeo-Persian or Farsi. And I'm not going to read them because I won't pronounce them properly, but uh, you can just take a look at those. And all of this is available on the Jewish language website, and this is in the Haggadah supplement. So now we get to the songs at the end of the Seder. And they have been translated into many languages, and there are some great melodies that I highly recommend that you use at your Seder. And you can do this if you use electronics on Passover, then you can play the videos uh, or you can learn them in advance and teach them to your family members at your Seder. Here is an example of Who Knows One in Ladino, Judeo-Spanish. Baruch <laughs> Quien supiese y entendiese, alabar a Dios, quiere ser cuál son los cinco. Cinco libros de la Torah, cuatro madres de Israel, tres nuestros padres son, dos Moshe y Aharon, uno es el Criador, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo. Quien supiese y entendiese, alabar a Dios, quiere ser cuál son los seis. Seis días de la semana, cinco libros de la Torah, cuatro madres de Israel, tres nuestros padres son, dos Moshe y Aharon, uno es el Criador, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo. Quien supiese y entendiese, Alabar a Dios, quiere ser cuál son los siete. Siete días con Shabbat, seis días de la semana, cinco libros de la Torah, cuatro madres de Israel, tres nuestros padres son, dos Moshe y Aaron, uno es el criador Baruch, Baruch Shemo. Que en su pie se entendiese, alabar a Dios, quiere ser cuál son los ocho. Ocho días de la mila, siete días con Shabbat, seis días de la semana, cinco libros de la Torah, cuatro madres de Israel, tres. Nuestros padres son dos Moshe y Aaron, uno es el criador Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo. Nueve meses de la preñada, ocho días de la mila, siete días con Shabbat, seis días de la semana, cinco libros de la Torah, cuatro madres de Israel, tres nuestros padres son dos Moshe y Aaron, uno es el criador Baruch Hu. Okay, so there you see some post vernacular use of Ladino. Um, I don't actually know who that performer was, but Ladino is not his native language. You can hear by his pronunciation. Uh, and I think probably Portuguese. I think he lives in Brazil. Um, but Ladino is still very important to a lot of people who have Ladino speaking ancestors. So next we have who knows one in Judeo-Arabic, specifically Syrian Judeo-Arabic. 
And this was also performed by Asher Shashalevi and Chloe Pumarati at the concert a few weeks ago. You can follow along on the side of your screen there. Um, but this is, uh, we're going to do the same thing that we did with the last few songs, where I'll do the first few stanzas and then. this year. <laughs> It'll be a hit. I agree. So you can see how the, the different versions of Who Knows One have differences in the things that they count, right? In some, it's the, the stars in Joseph's dream or the stars in the sky, sky here for 11. Um, here we have seven days for Chupa rather than seven days of the week. And um, two are Moshe and Aharon instead of Luchot Habrit. So you see a number of interesting differences, but you also see similarities between the Judeo-Arabic version and the Ladino version. Next, we turn to Chad Gadya. And this has also been translated into many languages. Here are some examples from Judeo-Georgian and Judeo-Italian in Rome. Judeo-Italian has many different dialects based on the different places where Jews lived in Italy. And this is the Roman version here. And Judeo-Georgian is spoken in Georgia. It's one of the few Jewish languages that wasn't ever written in Hebrew letters. It was written in the Georgian alphabet, but most of the speakers today have moved to Israel and lost uh, their language and have not passed it on to their <coughs> So here's an example of Chag Gadya, also in Syrian Judeo-Arabic. And I will let Asher and Chloe take it away.
in Ladino called Un Cavritico. We're going to just do this one. This is Bukharian, also known as Judeo-Tajik, spoken by Jews in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and that area. It's related to Persian as well.
song i hope that you'll all do some of these songs at your passover seders this year and i want to open it up for questions now so let me see there are some in the chat so the question from amanda is besides the obvious celebrating passover have you noticed any similarities between languages and communities well yeah there are many similarities not just passover but also Every Jewish holiday has some similarities in Jewish communities around the world and some life cycle events and some uh, observances of Jewish traditions. Um, but all of them also have interesting differences. So I've done this event and created these resources surrounding Passover, but I could also do similar resources surrounding Purim or Hanukkah or Rosh Hashanah. There are so many interesting differences in all in the ways that these holidays are celebrated. And one interesting similarity is the incorporation of Hebrew words into the local language. Um, and there's also a lot of wordplay where people use elements from the local language that sound like Hebrew words or vice versa. And if you look at the Facebook page of the Jewish Language Project, you can see some examples of that from Purim, uh, where Jewish communities around the world have interesting and distinctive ways of talking about the Purim holiday. So someone else asks, what are the names of the two instruments being played? Um, so yes, the, the larger one is an oud and the smaller one is called a kamanche, Chloe's instrument. Thank you. Uh, so who else has a question? I, I have another one, but do I have to type it or can I? No, you can it? say it. Hi. Okay. So hi, I'm Amanda. Um, this is awesome. So thank you. Um, so yeah, I meant I obviously there were other other holidays, but I meant kind of you kind of answered in the latter of um, how they use they're using wordplay and languages. So I guess it was more of like besides the obvious of celebrating Jewish holidays have you noticed similarities between languages and communities? Oh, right. Yeah. So the, I'll be speaking about this in April. I'm going to be doing a lecture. Oh, I guess it's already April. 
happy April, everybody. Uh, in a few weeks, I'm going to be doing a lecture series on Thursdays with the Jewish Language Project in collaboration with Jewish Live, where I talk about Jewish languages. So I'll, I'll give more information about that. But just a quick summary is that Jewish languages around the world have several similarities. They tend to be based on a local language, but incorporate Hebrew words, Aramaic words, and other influences from those languages, like translations of a Hebrew phrase into the local language that doesn't really work grammatically in the local language because it's an imitation of the Hebrew. They tend to be written in Hebrew letters, or they did until modern times when people started to become more literate in the local languages, and then they were written in the local alphabets. Um, so that's why you saw those examples from Judeo Tat, where they, it was originally written in Hebrew letters, but then Cyrillic and uh, Latin and, um, and various other alphabets. Um, they also tend to have influences from other languages, from languages that were spoken before the most recent migration. Um, and sometimes also from the local languages around them. Jews have always been multilingual, if not fully proficient in Hebrew, um, they may have had some exposure to another language that their ancestors spoke before migrations. And also Jewish languages tend to have other distinctive features. Sometimes they're so different from the language around them that they're really not, they shouldn't be considered dialects, they should be considered separate languages. And other times they're so similar that people wouldn't even necessarily recognize that someone is a speaker, that someone is Jewish based on their language. Other questions? Okay. So if there are no other questions, then I can play one more clip. I'll just wait another minute in case someone does is, is in the middle of sending in a question here. The last clip that I want to play is a beautiful rendition. It's actually in Hebrew, but it's a beautiful rendition of part of the Hallel that is sung at the Passover Seder. So let me play that. So in this clip, they sing it in three different languages, Minha Mesar, but I'm going to start with the one they sing, the last one they sing, which is... <laughs>
pure joy, pure joy in that scale. Mm. So beautiful. The scale of celebration, la mm -hmm. And I think this is a perfect thing to, to, for all of us to um, be enlivened during these narrow times and these narrow spaces when we're all confined to our homes and really worried about the current plague that we're experiencing. Um, and I wanna just end with uh, an image of happy Passover in Jewish languages around the world. Um, in the Haggadah supplement, you will see this image along with many other fun facts about Passover in Jewish languages, like the fact that the word for chickpeas, garbanzo beans, in Judeo-Arabic is, is hummus, and that sounds very similar to the word for chametz, hummus, right? So, I mean, I know I'm not pronouncing it right, but uh, it sounds very similar. And so for that reason, Jews who live in Arabic speaking lands do not eat chickpeas on Passover, even though they eat other kidneyot. So that's a really weird example of how language can influence Jewish observance. And here are some examples of how you say happy Passover in Jewish languages. So in Judeo-French in Bordeaux, France, bon fête. And I mentioned before the Juhuri one, Judeo taught Nisan Nushmu Shor Giro, that Nisan is the name of the month that Passover occurs in, and that is how you say Passover in Judeo taught. In Ladino, there is a difference in gender. Men would say Moadim le Simha, and women would say Pesach Alegre. And those Moadim le Simha is from. Hebrew and uh, Pesach Alegre involves Hebrew and a Spanish word. Uh, Jewish Neo-Aramaic in Iraq, a dad patire bricha, blessed matzot festival. In Jewish Malayalam in India, nale pesahe pernal, happy Passover. Judeo-Persian in Tehran, moedetun mubarak bashe. In Yiddish, in Lithuania, a zisin un kosh un kosherin pesach, a sweet and kosher Passover. In Jewish Amharic, in Gondar, Ethiopia, melkam yachkita be'al, the holiday, fine holiday of unleavened bread. In Judeo Arabic, in Morocco, ikun olik eid mbarak. In Judeo Provencal, in Avignon, France, spoken in, in the south of France, um, no longer though, it is uh, now extinct. Bon Santu, good holiday. And um, Santu is actually the word Yom Tov because the Y is pronounced S in Judeo Provencal. So good Yom Tov is what that means. Good, good day. Uh, and in Western Yiddish in Alsace, fr France, Bawit Gut. That is an interesting one because it is it means build well, and it's a reference to the building of the temple because of the song Adirhu that is sung at the end of the Seder that talks about the rebuilding of the temple. In Judeo-Italian in Rome, buon mongede. Now the ayin in Judeo-Italian is pronounced ng, ng, like ngainare means to see from ayin, the, the, the um, word for eye. And so this means a good holiday, a good moed. And in Judeo-Georgian in Georgia, bedinieri pesachi. And in Judeo-Greek, in Yanina, Greece, where the Romaniot Jews live, Kalo Pesach, good Passover. But you could also say Pascha, which can also mean Easter. Uh, so you see here so many differences, but also similarities that many of these languages use Hebrew words, but not always the same Hebrew word, right? Sometimes it's Pesach, but sometimes it's Nisan, and sometimes it's Moed, and sometimes it's... Uh, uh, what oh bow it's good which is not even a Hebrew word at all so there are so many different there are so many similarities and differences in Jewish languages around the world and I hope that you will take what you've learned in this brief lecture and concert and use it to enrich your Passover Seder thank you very much Thank you, Sarah. This was fascinating. We all uh, well, celebrate, celebrate Passover with our families, but um, we, we never know there's so many ways to celebrate Passover in so many languages, and it was beautiful. 
I wish I could also thank Chloe and Asher for the for the music. They're not here, but I'll let them know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. If you can um, just repeat the website where people could find all those resources, the session will be live on our Facebook, and I will send everyone the link. It's also someone sent it, um, I think, in the chat. Uh, but if you can uh, repeat the name of the website and also people ask when is your next session. Okay, sure. So I just put the link in the chat. It's jewishlanguages.org slash Passover. And then once you're on that website, you can find, uh, you can click on the events button and you'll see the list of lectures. And soon I'll be posting information on how to register for that. Okay, Great. thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Happy Passover. Stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. There's a lady leaving over there. <laughs>